I was um, sitting over here in my lovely office here today, and I started thinking to myself, as like, when did I really get intrigued by technology? So I kind of wanted to share, and then I wanted to get your guys' ideas, too, and perspectives of when that grabbed your attention. Um, back when I was a young lady um, in grade school, there was a thing called the WizKid. So it looked like a mini computer that you could plug in, like different games of math and science and reading. And it had a lot, the, the keyboard that you could like choose. And then I was so fascinated of like how you could plug and play and like get all these fun games to pop up and then test how smart you were. As a young person, I was like, yeah, I'm really cool. Um, and <laughs> it was like the best thing ever. So if you guys have never heard of it, you got to Google it. But um, I know, Kelsey, you're on here today. What about you? I was going to say mine's similar, but not quite the same thing where I didn't feel like how smart I was. It was more I wanted something and I had to figure out how to use technology in order to get it. But of course, you know, I wanted to play my Barbie computer game and you had to install it. So, of course, I just did the click next, 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 except it wait. And I was like, look, it works and everything is great. So I was a spoiled child and I had a computer in my room. So I got to figure out how to play all of the computer games. I know. I know. I was that kid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about you, Matthew? Um, so the first time I really remember having to, first, it, it's a game as well. Um, Space Hulk on DOS required that you, uh, use the manual to, uh, type in words to be able to play the game as a, a old DRM star. And, uh, I couldn't read at the time. I was quite young. And so I taught myself to read so I could play that game. Um. <laughs> I, I I couldn't help myself. It seemed so much fun. Um, and then obviously struggling as a uh, a teenager to try and record things and and learning how all of the audio tools worked and and everything was kind of the the time when I really dug into it. But my parents like to tell that first story a lot. Uh, <laughs> AJ, what about you? Um, it probably was you know like free demo games uh one of them that sticks out is uh one that came with Chex serial called Chex quest um and then uh back in the 90s and early 2000s uh there used to be video game magazines and they had discs they had demo discs and i remember uh not wearing those out but playing those just you know those games to you know kingdom come it was it was so much fun just you know playing those games and being a kid it was like i could easily switch from one to another to another uh and not have to you know spend you know 150 dollars for three games so how about you todd um it, what was the question was uh, what's the first gaming that really got you into games or was this uh no i'm just kidding um <laughs> <laughs> i love I, I love that every single buddy person was games and and yeah. i i mean ultimately that's kind of where my draw was too um but what really got it into me is i'm gonna i'm gonna go back uh, many many years ago is when when i was uh young and dumb i i thought i was gonna be a rock star it was just it was a given and um, surprisingly, that did not work out for me. So my backup plan then was I was going to record music because I was going to make a ton of money. And also, this did not work out for me. However, um, when I was going through the process of trying to figure out how you record, et cetera, et cetera, I'd gone to college for it and I was learning all of this stuff. And as I was going through it, they were making me get into the components. So if any of the equipment, whether it's an amp or recording equipment failed, I needed to be able to repair it myself. So I had to go through the process of getting in and get fixing circuit boards, et cetera. Um, and when I graduated from school, I'd actually picked up a job at an organization that made professional sound cards for PCs. And this is many, many years ago, by, as some can probably tell by gray hairs if you're watching on YouTube. Um, so uh, that was kind of the perfect mix for me. And um, it, it, it was it was great. So, I mean, I really had to learn PCs back then. They they just this is kind of my glass shattering moment uh, that I think we're going to talk about here shortly is the stuff just barely freaking worked. Right. So you, when you had problems with it, you literally tore the entire computer apart and, and had to get your hands on the boards and 
it was crazy stuff. Um, but but the game that really changed it for me um, was a book uh, game called Duke Nukem 3D. I had to take the uh, PC home because I did not have my own PC at that time. They were too expensive. Um, and the big CRT, I got to carry the big CRT around and and play it. And uh, my wife hated it. So I had to wear headphones and, and inevitably she would come up behind me and start talking to me. And while I was playing the game, which would scare the livid crap out of me. So uh, that's my intro. I think the uh, the universal experience of of playing that game and having someone jump scare you from behind is <laughs> <laughs> a large part of my and my siblings' childhood. Uh, <laughs> well, I wanted to thank um, Todd because he did get us kind of directed back of really why we're here today, um, and he mentioned glass shattering. But for for those of you that are listening um, today, we're talking about the CIT Tech for Business podcast. And our big topic is glass shattering. But before we kind of get into the nuts and bolts of all of that, thank you all for sharing. But I wanted to do some introductions. So we have Tara, myself, and Kelsey on the marketing team that are going to be moderating today's podcast. We have AJ or Andrew, as we call him, to uh, customer strategy advisors. We have Matthew, his, who is our GRC analyst. And Todd, also known as a rock star, I guess, in a previous life, is our (laughs) chief operating officer and CISO. But um, I'll kind of get it started with glass shattering in general. Let's kind of open this up and for discussion. And who wants to take it? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, go. So I I feel it's it's fair that as the person who who mentioned this first, I'll (laughs) I'll kind of dig into it. All right, Matthew, you're up. Um, so I, I started in in service center um previously i have worked for for other tech companies but but my experience in the msp space started in service center as a tier one and as part of that learning networks when previously i'd been more software heavy uh there was a couple of moments where i distinctly remember sitting down because i was so shocked by the things that had just fallen into place about how networks worked or how systems worked um that probably that felt to me that they should have been clearer far earlier <laughs> than they were and so that's that's really what i wanted to discuss and see if anyone else had had those experiences um i'm happy to to kick off with the first one which was um when i when i realized for the first time that people running the servers in their office and and simple simple servers maybe just doing file shares or things that everyone would have in their business back when this moment happened at least um ran the exact same way as regular websites on the internet that it was just a larger system in a cloud storage location instead um and that the the services the ports the systems i'd been learning how to use to make these networks work completely tied in with the way that the whole internet ran um I, I don't mind if I'm telling on myself for some of the people listening right now and saying, how did you not realize that earlier? Well, I, I just didn't. It wasn't something I thought about. Um, and so that's those are the things I really want to hear about because they are I think it's interesting for all of us and how it ties back to what we learned and, and what we enjoy most about this job, because those moments are the things that I remember probably the most clearly from my first couple of years in the industry. I, I think that was a great point. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll jump in too. Um, so going back to my my first job out of college when I started getting into ne- technology, um, we used to do trade shows as the way to kind of sell this product that I was talking about, the sound card for the PCs. And um, as we were doing it, one of the first things that we were trying to do was be able to link our computers together so we could basically create a network. And I didn't know anything about it. I mean, it was just like, hey, look, here's a hub. And we just started connecting everything together. Um, And it was a couple of years later where I kind of dawned on me that this was not common knowledge that you don't just do that. Um, To the point where getting back to gaming a little bit, I used to run LAN parties back in the day too, because the internet wasn't nearly fast enough to to play your games on. Um, And again, you would set this up and people would just come in and they're just mystified how they could make all these computers play these big games on this we would typically do them in hotels and whatnot, but it, it just didn't really dawn on me that this was complicated stuff at the time. And it was just really interesting to learn a few years later that, well, this just doesn't come second nature to everybody. Uh, one of the glass shattering moments for me 
personally was when I was um, taking a university course and it was called Computer Organization and Assembly Language. Uh, and that's a lot for a course title, um, but the way that it really stuck with me was we started with ones and zeros um, and like an AND gate and an OR gate um, and, and how that is working with computers. So, uh, you know, logical tables, uh, logic tables, uh, translation from binary to decimal and decimal to hexadecimal and understanding the different things in place. Um, so when I went to networking or I had a networking course, it made sense why, you know, this may get a little too deep in the woods, but uh, why some of the numbers were 255 and some were zero. Uh, or, or they had that range from zero to 255. And you're like, oh, and it really started to click with me then of like really the, the, the deep down like, oh, this is where it's coming from. And in that course, we did all those things and we, we made random access memory uh, on paper. Uh, like it wasn't obviously that, that much uh, memory, but using the ones and zero inputs using and or gates and nor gates and nand gates and all those different gates that can have logical inputs we made memory and that was that was a big part for me where i'm just like this is cool like um i put down a quote i've i've had it on my teams for a while uh it's from it's arthur c clark uh who is a uh, science writer um science fiction writer and his third law is any um significantly advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic uh and i feel like that's what a lot of things are um if that is not just technology but um even if you look at you know automobile production um you're like oh it's you just go to a dealership and it's like oh well there's a lot of steps that go into getting that car to the dealership uh, and it takes a lot to provide this podcast to you uh, through YouTube um, from the recording of it, where we're all in different locations, um, to putting it on, into the cloud and how that is a repeatable process every single time. Um, and I obviously I don't know all of those steps, but it's even wanting to go through those steps and being like, oh, yeah, like that's I want to. I want to know more like, OK, so I, I know how this works locally and you can talk to other stuff. But how do you talk to like, how do I talk to Todd? How, I, how can I talk to Matthew? How can they talk to each other without talking to me? And that's really got uh, got me excited. So it was the Rainbow Bridge that got you excited, right? And it looks yeah. like magic. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it really was, like, you know, like it, it does look like magic, you know, like you use your voice like now right like you use your voice to turn lights on and off uh yeah. i had you know you had to use the clapper before and now it's you know a different kind of <laughs> loud obnoxious voice which is uh me i guess but um so yeah it's uh it's just fun uh, like understanding and trying to understand that stuff i i definitely feel that there's a it, that quote especially is is one of my favorites also and and the way that when you kind of know some of this stuff it feels like the it flattens like there there can be times when these realizations are not always positive like it kind of takes away some of the magic um i play guitar um I had similar dreams to todd um <laughs> and so there are times when i'd learn to play a song and then i just go oh that's that's all it is it sounds magic <laughs> when it's on the radio and it's just oh um it doesn't happen often normally it stays there but every now and again it ruins a song and that's unfortunate um from the tech side of things one of the other ones i i like to to go back to was when i i first realized and i'm gonna dive into the the technical side a little bit here but i'm hopefully gonna pull it out enough that it's not completely not understandable um every network device that gets 
uh, that shows up on every device that shows up on your network gets an IP address, right? Um, for you to see it, it needs one. That's the extent I'm going to go into that. Uh, <laughs> we get into MAC addresses? We can. Um, no. Uh, it's magic. <laughs> uh, we'll hand wave the magic, the magic and move on. Um, talking about switches in particular, which send and, and transfer the data around the network. About, about six months to a year into working in Service Center, I realized or, or found out that they run basically on single XML files, really, really basic text files effectively. And when you reset the device, when you save things on the device, all it's doing is updating that file. And then when the device turns on, it checks that file for the information it's looking for. And just following that magic, these are 48 port, 56 port devices that run the entire network. They have gigs, gigs, terabytes of data running through them. And it's a four kilobyte text file that manages all of it <laughs> and it's the backbone for every single network all exactly. over the world and, and, and not just yeah. your home network it's... not just your work network not just the router that you have that runs your uh your wi-fi and everything at home it's the systems that run full cloud data centers mm -hmm. run off these four kilobyte and if they get confused for even a second if that file becomes corrupt it's gone <laughs> so that that was a to kind of tie in with what Todd said before, it's barely running. Uh, <laughs> so, like, it's it's obviously works well. It works very well. But sometimes you look at it and you're like, that doesn't seem like enough. It feels like there should be more. Mm -hmm. I, what what a mild tangent? Well, I have multiple tangents that I really want to get into, <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll do the one real real quick. Is back to the guitar thing, the riff, um, Black Keys, and Kenny said anybody is curious about them. Their riffs sound killer. And they are extremely basic. <laughs> All right. So my other one was was going back to um, one of the previous podcasts that we have at CIT was one of our origin story, if you will. Um, and as I'm listening to it, I've been in tech 30 plus years. Um, if anybody's curious how long that goes back, it's a long time. And um, we're they're talking about all of the old technologies, the way that networks used to work, which is token ring and all kinds of other stuff. And um talking about that that correlation between the magic and and the way things used to be is it's amazing what we have for technology today back then the stuff i i'm not kidding this stuff just barely freaking worked and the problems that you ran into were unbelievable and compared to today it, everything just works for all intensive purposes and that's the way computers have really become i would make the correlation to almost like a, a telephone right and and now of course telephones are even kind of old comparative to cell phones but when you pick it up you just expect the dang thing to work and it does and that's kind of the way pcs were they didn't used to be that way 30 years ago the things just barely freaking worked um to get what you needed to run out of a business it was pretty remarkable that we got done what we were able to do and how much things have changed with to Andrew's point of how this process works comparatively it was unfathomable a couple of years ago. And I think I think part of it, too, is the extension to moving a lot of the stuff that we had to, we had to know uh, when we came into the industry, um, you know, was it, it's changed so much, um, you know, like even when I started. 13 years ago, we were still doing on-prem mail servers. Um, and that isn't something that, you know, we recommend now because there's a service that you can go to. Uh, they're called Microsoft. Uh, they have hosted mail uh, or they're Google or it's, you know, one of those other people who, for lack of better words, they're your hosted mail provider now, uh, right? Like, you don't need to set up your own. You can, like, by all means, if you want to set up your own mail server, I knew a lot of people back in the day where they're like, hey, you can do this. There's a lot that goes into it. Uh, it's a turnkey solution, and Microsoft has been able to kind of take that, you know, that magic and being like, hey, here's a little packet of magic that you can just, here's an email address, um, and make it for businesses uh, instead of, you know, being like, okay, so I need to do a mail server and I need these records to make sure when somebody goes through that they can, that they're able to send a message to my, my account. And then what happens when, 
my PST file that's on my computer gets too big or gets corrupted and somebody can't get to it. Um, it's yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff that, um, you know, really, if you don't keep up with it, um, it, it can it can pass you by pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, it's I, I don't know where I was going with that, but <laughs> I, I like that. I, there was a, a lot of analogies that I learned when I was starting that are also completely irrelevant now. Um, and tying in with that one, we, we used to think of on-site or on-prem exchange as the mail room in a building. And I don't know many buildings that have an in-house mail room anymore. <laughs> so I mean, it's, it's just changing and we're seeing this change. It's it's outsourced. It's, it's you know, courier systems that come and pick it up for you, et cetera. Um, one other thing that I, I think that ties in with was a a story about the OSI model that I really like, and I'm going to try and recall it verbatim, so I apologize if I get anything wrong. I'll try and keep it generic. The OSI model is basically the, the system we use to describe how data transfers across a network. Go and look into it. If you, if you haven't already, it's definitely interesting. If you're interested in that already, um, I definitely don't recommend trying to use it to spark an interest <laughs> in tech. Um, <laughs> I think I can tell the story without digging into it too deeply. But effectively, when it was being created, it was when networks and, and token ring, as Todd mentioned, were, were already in use. And so the people who were building this, this model, which was designed to describe how data flowed through a network, they were very specific with it. They wanted it to seem like a standard that everyone could follow, so it was very clear. You'll hear some of these used in the term, way we talk about services, ports, um, uh, the way all HTTP data flows, etc. cetera. Um, by the time they'd finished planning it and put it out, the people who were using the systems had already decided that TCP and UDP formats would be used to wrap all data that traveled across a network. I'm being very gener generic here. There is obviously lots of caveats to that, but that's what that had been decided by the vast majority. And because of that, the OSI model doesn't always make sense when you're starting out because it seems like everything should fit neatly into this box, but it doesn't because it wasn't designed in use. It was a look at how great everything could be while people began using it the way that made sense. <laughs> and I think there are a lot of things that we'll see in tech that generally if something doesn't make sense, it's because a similar thing happened. Trying not to think of it as this organization released this product. They also released a 10,000 page manual and great descriptions on how to use it. And everyone read that book and uses the correct language all the time. That doesn't happen. <laughs> In fact, unless you're needing it to pass a certification or or anything, I very it, it's hard to find people using the same language for two things all the time, especially across departments. Um, that communication and describing what you're saying, even the word server, uh, I have very specific opinions on what that word means, um, and that can change if you're non-technical, if you're an on-site engineer, <laughs> et cetera. It's different for everyone. Um, so instead of thinking of of these things you you hear in these rules as static, always in place rules, a lot of the one of my glass shattering moments was realizing that a lot of these things didn't cross over. You had to learn the language that the individual device used, the language that the individual team used, um, and and then trying to collaborate on that and maybe dig in deeper to make sure that that communication was clear to everyone. Yeah, and um, I think I think that communication was big. I I started my technology journey uh, doing pure phone support um, for a third party ISP, uh, and it was mainly. Um, older people who would call in who needed some technology help. Um, I feel like that helped me. It was kind of trial by fire of 
how to explain things to people without being too technical, but still getting the information you needed. Um, so trying to explain these complex, you know, sometimes complex things, uh, like how to can like, why does my pop server port need to be 110? Um, you know, or the secure SMTP need to be 587. And so uh, those are complex things that get down to that OSI kind of model and the ports and the TCP of, okay, you can really dig into the weeds and and go, okay, what what's this port used for? What's this one used for? Um, you need to relay that information to some people, but it's like, okay, how can I dis like how can I like direct this person to this specific part so they can configure the email service that they were using um so yeah that uh that really helped and you know even just troubleshooting sometimes uh we joke about it in it um but restarting a computer really does like that that really is the first thing we say um because there's so much stuff that goes on in your computer right like you open up Teams and you only use Teams. There's so much stuff in the background. Um, you you know you just play games on your computer. There's so much stuff that goes on in the background and the communication. And as Matthew said before, with the switch, some anything goes wrong with you know a little bit of file, it can act weird. And that computer is that refresh. That reboot is that kind of refresh restart uh and it really helps with it so if that's a switch that you turn off and on if that's a router like it it it, it really is a trope for any it uh and i highly recommend the it crowd which is a a, a british <laughs> tv show uh that they answer their department they're in the it department and they answer the phone in their department saying hello it have you tried turning it off and on again um <laughs> because it really is that's that's kind of the thing. Sometimes the simplest thing and, um, you know, it, it is it can fix it and you don't need to know why every time you just can fix it um, to, you know, some people who have people come on site for technology and they're like, you just restarted it and it fixed it. And it's just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you know, it shouldn't. I, I I agree. I always it was one of the things that I learned through the years too. And it was to your point is how do you explain that? And I think you did a really really nice job. And and I'll just try to repeat what you said slightly different is. Um, everybody uses their PC. Their phones are the same thing, right? Every once in a while, you got to restart your phone. Everybody's using it differently. Even if Kelsey and I are playing the same video game. She may do something slightly different than I did. She checked her email first, whatever. Um, my brother is in programming, and so he always says this. And he's when we talk about why people break stuff, he's like, well, I didn't program it to do that. How was I supposed <laughs> to know you'd ever do that? That's what happens with your PC. Is they 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 built in as much as they possibly can for redundancy. And quite frankly, they're they're remarkable how well and redundant and um ability to withstand everything at, at this point. But unfortunately, there is a, a strange mix that every once in a while the bits get garbled and you just resetting it is enough to to get everything right in the world again. I, I don't know about you guys, but I reboot my my Wi-Fi router about once a month just because I should. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I think this, it's nice, though, to say like there is a method to the madness behind some of that when you do ask some of those simplest questions because that technology language that you were talking about, AJ, before and then the zeros and the ones like it all has to kind of. Um, connect and I guess I wouldn't do um, my job justice if I with the moderator here today to get us kind of wrapping up because I know we're getting close on time. Um, so I just wanted to ask if you guys had any parting words as we're going to be wrapping up today to leave with our listeners. I uh, I do. I, I won't. I won't backtrack, but I do want to tell a joke that uh, ties in with what Todd said. Um, <laughs> one of my uh, one of my best friends is a, a QA, a quality analyst uh, for a, uh, a software company. And uh, one of my favorite jokes about this is a, uh, a quality assurance analyst walks into a bar and orders a beer, orders a million beers, orders negative six beers, orders an elephant. Because these are the types of things that people might do 
and you need to be prepared for. <laughs> and so it just ties in with with how those that you may not think that you're doing these things, but in comparison to what the programmer prepared for, they probably didn't prepare for you to order an elephant, um, and that may cause problems. Well, that's great. Now I'm going to have to go next time I go into the bar and order an elephant and see what the happens <laughs> if there was a program in their in their system. So we'll have to report back to you guys. You're probably going to get cut off. <laughs> that's a good point maybe i will we'll try it we'll see yeah <laughs> um but no i wanted to um thank you guys all kelsey todd aj and matthew for um, joining our podcast today um always a great discussion and yeah we had some tangents but that's our thing we like to do that but I do want to say, um, if you guys have any feedback, please visit cit-net.com backslash podcast, or we'd love to hear from you via email as well. As a, um, AJ had talked about, we use Microsoft, so you can get an email to us by info at cit-net.com. If you have any topics that you would like for us to discuss, we're always open to that. So, But thank you again, um, and we look forward to chatting with you guys more next week. 